For $5 a month, you can actually see the Thin Green Line interviews and other video content on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And feel like you're part of the conversation. Join us. We're back with the Thin Green Line podcast. And John Norris is back from the desert. Baja. <laughs> <laughs> My first question was if he got the sand out of him yet. And uh, uh, it was no. <laughs> yeah, man, Wayne, it's, uh, it's good to be back. We have a really good lead-in for a very special guest we're going to talk about in a minute. But, uh, yeah, our, our Monster Energy Can-Am team just finished racing the Baja 500 the second uh, race in the score series down in Baja. And there's four races this year. There's the 250, which we did, which uh, we've all talked about with, uh, with our listeners, um, the 500 we just completed, and then the 400 in September, and then the big Baja 1000 that's coming up in November. And this isn't a, this is an inaugural real special Baja 1000 because it's not a typical loop race. It's a point to point. So it starts all the way in Northern Mexico and goes all the way down to La Paz, Cabo San Lucas, in a straight line and it's 1400 miles and it's sort of one of the, it's going to be the most grueling, most challenging yet most epic, beautiful Baja 1000s they've ever run. So it's a big year for our team. And, uh, this, uh, the 500 we just got back from was, was epic. Uh, but it was wrought with challenges. You know, uh, uh, I, I posted on Instagram and I know you, you responded and, and Facebook that even during free running, I was uh, navigating with another driver and uh, got up on the edge of a big desert wash and the wash gave way. And we did a sideways roll a couple times, 14 feet below us into a wash. And, uh, you know, the racers say, if you haven't rolled a UTV yet and tested all your safety equipment, like your, your PRP five point harnesses, your solid seats, your good helmet systems, your roll cages, you really haven't cut your teeth, you know, uh, on, on racing uh, in Baja. And well, so we rolled. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Came out of that pretty unscathed and uh, worked with my partner on it. We had a good laugh over it, but it it really isn't a laughing matter. It's one of those things where just like in law enforcement with our personal protection tools and firearms, defensive tactics, um, you know, how we perform in our vehicles, mm-hmm. wearing our seatbelts all the time, getting in high speed pursuits, it can go sideways really quick. So we take it very seriously because it's a very dangerous sport, especially the, uh, the Baja circuit down there um, and that protective equipment basically allowed us to come out of a pretty serious role completely unscathed but aside from that the race was epic we uh we were leading uh the pack at mile 255 at the halfway point and that's where we exchanged drivers and co-drivers and when we were doing that we noticed something wrong with the transmission we had broken axle axles on these side by sides break a lot on a race course that that uh, difficult we carry axles on the machine and it's a quick repair and fix for us just like belts Wow. CBT belts. But <laughs> in this case, when the axle sheared, part of the axle went up into the transmission housing and actually punctured the transmission housing, which never happens. And to replace the transmission in a race is a five hour process. Mm. And so for most teams, um, they're not going to do that replacement. They're just going to call the race a wash because it's so difficult. We had an extra transmission. We had a Cognito Motorsports, our competitors, but good friends. Their pit crew was there at the driver's exchange. So our two drivers at the point, Captain Matt Burroughs and Bradley Howe with Cognito were there for almost five hours, changing that transmission in the middle of the night, putting new axles in, got back on the race course, con- uh, connected with us later on in the race and made the finish line well before the 20 hour deadline. There was a 20 hour deadline for this race and we got in right around 16 hours and some change. But after all of that, where we just wanted to get a finish because there's a no quit attitude, we will not quit unless we physically cannot finish a race. Um, It's one thing not to place in Baja. It's another thing not to finish Mm. because just finishing is winning in Baja to get that finisher pin. And we didn't only finish, but we actually took 12th because (laughs) all of the other pro UTVs in our class we're having all kinds of drama too, because that course was just rough. Yeah. So we still came out well, you know, and we're really happy with that finish. And I think when I, we came straight home from that. And I think by the time I got to bed midnight the next day, I had calculated being up for 47 hours straight. It was, uh, I haven't been up nonstop without rest that long since met missions back in the day, long sniper deployments. So it was a good test and refresher for these longer races, mm. uh, but it's good to be home safe. And the team did great. And uh, 
like we say, fill and flow on Met, fill and flow on Monster Energy, adapt, overcome, get back in the race. And now we just recover and onward to the next one. Yeah, no, that's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, and, and yeah, just to, to tr- switch out a transmission, finish a race at 12th, I think that's that's a huge feat. I mean, that's just got to suck when they say, yeah, you need to, we need to switch out a transmission. That's got to be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, splitting cases, taking motors ah. apart on a race course with lights, you know, in the middle of the Baja Desert is is not the most desirable repair to do. But And it's the first time, honestly, we've ever had to do it as a team. That has never come up. It's never gotten that bad. Wow. And we still we still completed the race. So, um, And we learned a lot from it. You know, now we know kind of how we can protect that transmission maybe a little better. Mm-hmm. We know where we need certain mechanics. You know, you know what parts you need and redundancy. Um, it might be smart to have a couple transmissions at two different parts of the course when you're spread out because we had – you know, we had four chase teams completely spread out over a 490 mile course mm. to try to be ready for any contingency. And you just never know where that problem's going to occur. And if you're even going to be able to get to the car. Yeah. And fortunately uh, we were, we were able to get to the driver's exchange. We did have other, you know, race team mechanics from other teams there. And we had an area that allowed us to do the work. Had we been in a more remote rough section of the race, uh, we would have been trying to recover that car all night, then trying to change the transmission. Right. And, at that point, Matt, our captain would have made an executive decision after we, we analyzed the situation and said, this isn't feasible. You know, it, we're not going to finish. Um, we can do this in a safer environment. Let's just recover the car and get out of here. And that's what several pro teams had to do during this race. There were a lot of DNFs, do not finishes from mm. really good racers in our class, friends of ours at other with other teams that they just got broke down in such remote areas the best they could do is recover their car and get out of there. Mm. You know, there was no way, no way they were going to make that deadline. So we were very blessed and fortunate. That wasn't our situation. Right. And just to let our listeners know, we are very internet relying on internet. We do uh, the video thing with zoom and we post it on our Patreon page. So if anybody wants to watch us, all the wardens watches, all the thin green lines are posted on our Patreon page for five bucks a month. What's that? Two coffees in California. That's probably just one coffee. Isn't it, John? Yeah, it's, yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe maybe half, half a Starbucks special. I, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we we appreciate you guys tuning into this, and and yeah. something else you can do for us is you know be sure to get up on that Apple rating mm. and give us that five star rating in both podcasts because Warden's Watch and Thin Green Line are branching out to listeners and viewers from non-traditional conservation circles. Absolutely. I've got, you know, guys in the desert racing community now watching our podcast and, you know, we're bringing conservation and OHV conservation to the off-road desert racing community. In fact, I can kind of tease this now because <clears throat> my buddy and teammate and, uh, you know, our, our awesome driver for Monster Energy, Bradley Howe, who's also the publisher of UTV Off-Road Magazine, we've done a, a Thin Green Line Razor article together for that magazine. And the Thin Green Line Razor bringing conservation to OHV world is on the cover coming awesome. up for the June edition. And um, we're going to have, a, it's going to be available digitally to everybody for free. Um, you can download it. I'll have links. Uh, Wayne, you and I can certainly talk about it. We can put up some images, Great. but it's going to be a really cool way to integrate, you know, everything thin green line, mm. um, including the desert racers that uh, have been so cool to embrace what we're about on this podcast. Yeah. So many groups want to engage with conservation and just don't know how. And, and to, to segue that, John, to be that ambassador to that group of desert racers, is just awesome to, to be that bridge. I, I, I love it. And I love that they're, they're lining up to cross that bridge. It's, it's just a great work. That's just super re- reaching out to people that really wanted to reach out to us, just didn't know how. So that that's awesome. On this uh, Thin Green Line podcast, uh, we had some yeah. internet issues. Uh, John was scheduled to, to be with me, and uh, his internet was down, which, uh, <laughs> and I've had that issue before. I, I, we were talking, I got struck by lightning or zapped from my computer when there was a thunderstorm, and I shut down. Uh, so sometimes uh, we go sideways on this. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately we do, guys, and and for all of you guys listening out there, bear with us sometimes because Wayne's in such a remote part of New Hampshire, mm. and I'm in a really remote part of of Montana. Yeah, and uh, you know, we were, in, we were in a summer thunderstorm, and uh, I lost internet for about another day and a half. But the cool thing is, when we talk about Jamie on this on this podcast, his story resonates with everything you know we do musically. It resonates mm. especially with uh, with Father's Day coming up. Wayne, as we've discussed, and and what Jamie went through, and just just an incredible story, an incredible country artist, 
um, that's been an entertainer all his life. He was, you know, passed down from the generations of mm. what his father started as a legacy of music, of country music. And, you know, people ask me all the time, they go, well, you know, you're a rock and roll guy, man. Yeah, you, do you listen to country? And yeah, of course I do. Mm. Um, I'm a big country fan because, it, you know, and you, and you talk to guys like Jamie Lee and other country artists that I've worked with um, and other billboard pop artists um, that I've, you know, uh, run around with um, when we were recording the audio book for Hidden War, actually, with, with Trammell Starks, the producer there. It doesn't matter what music you perform and it doesn't matter what music you you favor it really matters that you just love music and you see what music does to uplift people, what it does to calm people, what it does mm. to bring people together. And Jamie Lee's that kind of guy. His music is powerful. Um, I don't think it's typical. It's from the heart mm. and the best country artist, uh, you know, that, that I really resonate with <clears throat> even coming from a rock and roll background, I sing several country songs as well. I just don't do them in this band. Um, and it's something that uh, is very special to me because country music has you know has has a a deep humanistic kind of connection kind of relationship uh kind of a nostalgic vibe to it that other genres don't have and that's what makes country music so cool and that's what makes jamie so cool for the music he performs and uh, the life he lives right wayne yeah no no doubt that you can make that connection i mean jamie lee started on stage with his father at three years old his father would yeah. take him up and Jimmy T is a legend in the state of Vermont. I've talked to some friends that know music, and they're like, oh, Jimmy T was a legend. You know, every honky-tonk, every place in Vermont. And Vermont's not a place that you think country music resonates, but it is. It has that outdoor, that grassroots, Vermont, uh, living off the land type of feel. That that's, that's where Jamie Lee was born. And then at 15, to jump into Jimmy T's band be playing in your dad's band, be singing in your dad's band, traveling with your dad, John. I mean, that is just yeah, it, bonds that are being made musically, like you said, that touch the heart and our soul. You know, it was just a devastation for Jamie Lee to lose his dad in 2019. And you said that that connection, you're right. J Jamie Lee wrote a song, Heaven's Got a Hellraiser, and we're, we're going to bring it in. This is the first thing in this podcast is I recorded that off his uh, YouTube video, which he said, go for it, because it, it touches your heart. It tells you, you know, how much love and joy he had for his dad. And he also sang at his dad's uh, his funeral, too. He And to have the guts to do that, I mean, uh, my, my, you know, my throat was all choked up watching Jamie Lee do this. But he's a performer, and his dad was a performer, and they, they brought this all together. So it's just... Yeah, Can, music's a wicked connection. You have more of a connection to it than I do, but I really enjoyed this podcast. We laughed a lot. We talked about some really deep stuff, and we had a lot of fun. So, yeah, you guys, you guys are gonna love this one. And I know mm. he's he's uh, connected to some other artists that we that we really love, and we may have them on the show as well. And you know, I think after you know with Jamie Lee being on the show, having Barry Kurtz from Shine Down, and yes. uh, certainly looking at you know other bands I'm connected to that we can have some guests, mm. uh, something we can all share, guys. And yeah. you know, the bottom line is all of these music artists have a deep connection not only to music, but they have a deep connection to conservation mm. they have deep connection to wildlife wild lands and waterways and you know they have been raised on the same way we've been raised right wayne they've mm. been in those country settings they found their inspiration to write great songs in the in the wilds of america and you're seeing more and more of that and you're gonna you're gonna hear more and more of that from the music from the music side from the musical community just like the desert racing community i'm part of now all of those guys and gals resonate deeply with being in the outdoors and bringing family bonds and friendships together through the medium of racing. We do it through the medium, our country artist, you know, Jamie, Barry, do it through the medium of music. We do it through the medium of being game wardens or mm. tactical instructors and everything else, you know, whatever other boxes we're checking today. And I know we're, we're <laughs> I'm involved in a lot of them. So <laughs> yes. uh, anything that brings us closer to nature, man, it's all good. It's unifying, and uh, we just want to bring more on board. But you guys are going to love this one with Jamie. It's it, it was it was a great conversation, like Wayne mentioned, and in just hearing the reviews and his story, uh, we look forward to doing more stuff with him as well. We're going to lead in with Heaven's Got a Hellraiser. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all those fathers out there. And if you lost a father, you know, listen to this song. Maybe your father was a Hellraiser too. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Yeah. 
was standing room only at the New Life Baptist Church. My dad stepped up to the pulpit to say a few words. Said my brother James was a good man, worked hard and loved his wife. The Lord knows he could raise the devil on any given night. But he believed in the promised land, so I know he's on his way. This ain't a day for mourning, it's a time to celebrate. Cause heaven got a hell raiser, a drinker and a good time chaser. I bet angels on Harleys, we're waiting at the pearly gates. If God loves a sinner as much as a saint, Lord, then heaven got a hell. And a ponytail Said y'all don't know me But I served with James in the jungle Back in 72 And one drunken night on r and r We got brothers in orange tattoos On more than one occasion That crazy fool saved my life I came all the way from California Say goodbye Cause heaven got a hell raiser A drinker and a good time chaser A bad angels on Harleys We're waiting at the pearly gates If God loves a sinner As much as a saint Lord in heaven got a hell On this episode of The Thin Green Line, we are interviewing Jamie Lee Thurston, country music singer. And music's not a hobby to Thurston. It's the only thing. The act of performing music is how he enters and relates to the world. And when you watch him live, it is as if you're witnessing a red giant, a star form before you, drawing in all the stardust and matter of the immediate universe to power its very being, even if you're only for a fraction of time. Jamie, I, I don't know who wrote that, but oh, <laughs> man. I, I, I'm from a, a, that era of Star Wars and everything. And when you're talking about drawing and that much power, so that, that just clicked. I, I, I'm like, I started watching your videos, and I can see where they got that because you are a powerhouse on the stage, man. That's that's dynamic. And, and don't, don't I'm, I'm going to continue to f- read this because – like I told you earlier, whoever wrote this is dynamic, and I want to hire her, too, to write, write about me. So, <laughs> And I'm assuming it's a her. It might be a him. I don't want to be sexist here. Actually, but. it is a her. Nice uh, job. Okay. Well, I, I, just the way it goes. I mean, that's, that's so descriptive. And I'm going to continue reading. Most musicians are great at one, maybe two parts of the musical quagmire. Leaning into those roles as far as the band, the creators, the pizzazz surrounding 
them carry the rest. It is admirable and well orchestrated feat, to be sure, and one that's been perfected by many decades of recording music live performance history. Music enthusiasts everywhere applaud their accomplishments and love them all the same. Thurston stands out as one of those rare performers that has achieved the next to impossible, the quadra effect. He has performed multifaceted roles as an entertainer, a vocalist, an instrumentalist, and a producer, an accomplishment unknown to most. And while he's great at all four aspects at any given time, to see him achieve them all at once, live, from the stage, is truly a monumental experience. It stands to reason that all music is good music, as long as it finds its way to one person who enjoys it. And in Thurston's set, there is truly something for everyone. His performance satisfies even the most varied tastes, covering classic, story-based country, and his exceptional abilities on the guitar takes audience where they least expect to go. On a ride with ACDC, Leonard Skinnerd, Bad Company, The Doors, Jerry Reed, and Deep Purple, to name a few. Nine studio albums later, Thurston's story is a parable of endurance, triumph over mediocrity. His career started with a white-hot flashbang and continues to steadily burn, taking him and his fans on a long-haul journey. His dedication to his craft and his love of entertaining surprises the newest fans and continues to thrill those who have carried him the whole ride. But with every other star-crossed story, it didn't happen overnight. In fact, he spent more of his life performing on stage than not, a fact that most people don't know. Thurston grew up with a milk bottle in one hand and a microphone in the other, accompanying his father during band rehearsals and eventually at gigs. He made his first live performance at just three years old. Anyone can imagine then, after more than 30 years on the road, he has assumed some stories. And boy, has he ever. Fans of Thurston's, otherwise known as the Thirsties, live for the story time parts of his sets because this man has seen more than most and lived to sing about it. His talent has taken him through Nashville music industry and label machine Warner Brothers, where he turned out singles for Montgomery Gentry, Rodney Atkins, and Tracy Atkins, including Rodney's chart-topping fan favorite, 15 Minutes. And he's shared stages with country music's biggest acts, such as Waylon Jennings, Roger Miller, the Dixie Chicks, Jason Aldean, Brad Paisley, Billy Carrington, and Charlie Daniels. He continues to burn up the road, and he's enjoying his recent entry into Europe and the U.K., crossing the pond at every opportunity. He'll keep fighting the good fight to play that solid, high-quality country and straight-up rock and roll to the people who most want to hear it, and he'll wield that Les Paul gold top as his weapon. After all, he's just getting started. Uh, like I said, who, whoever wrote that, Jamie Lee, she's a dynamic writer. Uh, <laughs> It, it, you know, I've read that through a few times, and I know I stumbled on it here and there because uh, the, the, those are those big words that I don't use a whole lot, but <laughs> they're very descriptive. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, you know, I don't sit around listening to myself much, and I surely don't read my bio, and I don't know. It's probably the same with you where you don't look a whole lot at where you've been. It's where more you're about going. where you're going, right? Mm. And so when I... When you read that, and I stop to think, yeah, it's been a long life. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I hope it goes on for a long time as well, but <clears throat> yeah. I like how she ends it, though. You're just getting started, because that's, that, that's how I felt listening to your stuff. And there's been such a flashback to that 90s era. I mean, I'm, I'm watching kids listening to that stuff. You know, my son's pulling up music that I listened to as a kid. And it's kind of blowing my mind that it's hanging in there at this day and age. And then you're now, and you're engaging in that, that same type that seems to be going towards that younger generation. They're looking for something new that's something old. God, that's funny. That's a great quote. You may be a song, there may be a budding songwriter <laughs> in you there, Wayne. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it, I mean, when you think about that, right, it's like not only, uh, I mean, things usually travel in a circle, Right. Mm -hmm. So conversations, if you'll, you know, when people talk, you'll get off on a tangent and it'll go right around or I can do it like this. It'll start going around and they'll start and end up right back where they started and go, oh, which brings me back to where I originally was, was. Mm -hmm. And I had one of my best friends one time go, it does. And how things can travel in a circle. And then you think about 
the world is a circle and it spins in a circle and you know so yeah just diving into the <laughs> diving into the deep end on the front there it is something to think about how mm. all that circle stuff you know it's just yeah it's interesting yeah uh, no so. it's interesting and if we if, if we can hang on for that circle like i said we're going to get music that we love to listen to with, with with new lyrics and new sounds but it's the same same thing that we loved yeah um and i uh, it'd be nice if things you know i well nothing stays the same right at the end of the day, one thing you can be sure of is that <laughs> pretty much nothing stays the same, right? right you are right, but if we could get some uh, new tunes that sound like Leonard Skinner, some new tunes that sound like ACDC, some new tunes that sound like Bad Company. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a freak for all that stuff. I mean, I also, uh, ZZ Top's in there. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I grew up, and it's funny because uh, a friend of mine is the, uh, a friend of mine, the director for the movie, mm. um, that we're doing, we, we can talk about later, but they were just at the Opry, which is like 15 minutes from where I live in Nashville. And, uh, they were doing a tribute for, uh, um, like a lifetime achievement thing for Billy Gibbons from ZZ top. Mm. So, you know, we we're, uh, another friend of mine who also knows him well, uh, we're backstage for all that thing. And, and, uh, it was cool to see that backstage and Eric church who, uh, actually, uh, there's a, a girl named Joanna Cotton who, um, she was on Warner brothers as well. And we were also signed to the same publishing company and we became instant friends. She's like a sister from another mister, right. Mm. To me. And, uh, you know, we both went on from Warner brothers and she's been singing backup for Eric, for Eric church for years. Anyways, she had told me that he was a great guy. And so I uh, was sitting there just videotaping this thing where he was doing uh, I'm bad. I'm nationwide. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's what he sang. But let me, let me back up. This was uh, Billy doing LaGrange, right? Rumors spreading around that Texas town, like a shack outside yeah. LaGrange. When he goes, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I it, like this because Eric church is great. I think songs are great. Does great records. And uh, anyways, there's a part where he looks back and Travis Tritt's behind him. And he looks like this is the real shit right yeah. here. And you see him with his arm going like this, going just how cool it is to be on stage or something like that. When you talk about old, you know, mm. something that's, that's, that's that classic becoming new again. It was just super cool to see. Because he's pretty much the hottest thing in country music right now. Right. And Billy Gibbons is, you know, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. I yeah. Mean, he's probably the coolest thing in rock music, right? No I mean, doubt. Dude, and he's a great guy, I would say, too. Like, uh, super good guy. Anyways, really cool. Cool to witness that, you know, as the uh, my friend Martin Gigi there, the director, the musical director for that, and is going to be the director for this movie. He said, man, you caught a moment. Yeah. And I did. It was awesome. So, yeah, you did that, that root stuff that we grew up with. I mean, those guys, I'm sure, even where they are, they look where they've been. And he was right in front of them performing. <laughs> it was so awesome. I, 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 yeah, I can't even imagine as a, a musician cool. being in that spot and watching that. It's just, yeah, to have, have somebody, you know, as popular as Eric Church have that look and then probably have that feel like, Man, he remembers when he was in in his house listening to that, you know, cranking, <laughs> thinking someday I'm going to be there. <laughs> I mean that it Billy Gibbons is the it's the only time I ever walked up to an artist. He was in the airport in Nashville, and I think this is before I moved here. So, uh, footnote, you know, I've lived here for over 23 years, and before I moved here, I'm from Vermont, Waterbury, Vermont, uh, to be specific. And I would fly back and forth every other week for two years before I moved here. Mm. So during one of those flights, I saw him uh, at the airport. And I just, I'm not a guy who goes up and asks for, you know, autographs, pictures, whatever. Even when I've been around him, you know, mm -hmm. I can tell you a story about Hank Jr. later. But anyways, that was the one time I sat there and I really, really contemplated going up to him going, hey, you don't know me, but... I'm going to get a record deal and I want you to play on my record sometime. Like that's what, that's what's going to happen in our future. 
Uh, only time I contemplated, I still never did it though. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let's go back to Vermont and let, let's go back to the movie too. Cause, uh, movies are wicked exciting actually. Uh, and it's going to be a mo- movie about your life, right? Yeah. So, um, it's a movie. So I use the word you know, wicked. Did you notice it. that you're used to wicked, yeah. right? Uh, cause a lot of people it's don't definitely... understand wicked. So, but I use it yeah. all the time. <laughs> wicked, cool. Wicked, good. Just but you being man, from Vermont, playing wicked. you understand it. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 When I moved down here, they'd go, what? Wicked? Mm-hmm. Well, wicked. Yeah. Duh. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. So, uh, what's going on is that there's a screenplay or it was a screenplay written on my life. Let me even back up further than that. I'll give yeah. you the reader's digest version. So, we were talking before uh, we started this podcast about you never know the effect you can have on anybody, you know, even a, a stranger just by a kind gesture or a conversation or whatever. So, you know, we were talking how my philosophy is make the world a better place one person at a time. Just be kind, right? Mm-hmm. Smile, be nice, whatever. So I'm in the Newark airport and uh, flying somewhere for a show. So I did have my guitar strapped on and, and, uh, but was sitting down. So it was next to me. And I don't know if the guy sat next to me or I sat next to him, but we strike up this conversation and, and the guy ends up, um, you know, he, uh, was an organic, uh, gardening guru, like had, uh, you know, his own TV show, um, his own magazine. Like I didn't know much about this, but was a serious music fan. So we started up a conversation. Well, that, you know, speed that up. He is now, you know, one of my best friends on the planet, right? From a cool. random sitting next to him in a Newark airport. And uh, his friend, and so he he had actually uh, done a documentary that got Roundup banned in Canada. Wow. And it won, I think, an Emmy or nominated for an Emmy or, yeah, some awards. Let's just put it that way. And his friend owned the largest independent film magazine in the world called Movie Maker. So he thought my story was so interesting that him and this other guy wrote this screenplay. Well, it's been supposed to, it's the entertainment business, right? Mm-hmm. So hurry up and wait and lots of, uh, lots of, lots of promises and not a lot of follow through in the music business. So, <laughs> or the entertainment business, shall we say? So anyways, that was probably a decade ago and it was supposed to have been made three times, right? Like, uh, the guitar player, uh, Andy Summers from the police was going to direct it and, and then at the last minute, he thought it should be a blues movie. And it's like, uh, yeah, well, I don't write blues songs. And then uh, Billy Bob Thornton was going to play my dad at one point. So all that to say, it's come back around. There's a director signed on, a producer signed on, you know, got a real budget. Uh, the producer just did a movie with Mel Gibson. So, yeah, it's all real stuff. And it's basically based on, you know, uh, the relationship between my father and me. <clears throat> so I've been singing since I was three years old and my father was my hero, right? Growing up, like yeah. everybody knew my dad. And, uh, when you would drive around, he'd get out of the car and somebody go, Jimmy T. Like, hey. <laughs> I mean, it was the coolest thing. So I started singing when I was three, I joined his band when I was 17. And, uh, throughout that time, <clears throat> it's, it's quite a story. Like I can tell you a story on how, I got a gold top Les Paul that would just blow your mind, right? Uh, for my birthday, which I will. It's a little, <laughs> it goes a little left, <laughs> but it's the truth. Yeah. Right? I told you before we started where I don't have many secrets. Like I've worked hard to, you know, be where I am and to the most important thing is to be a good person, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the day, it's like that's what you can, to have integrity and honesty. And that's what you can hang your hat on. The mm-hmm. rest of the stuff, it's going to come and go, and it is what it is. You know, yeah. you just you just try your best. So, and anyways, tr- all truth that to never say, changes. That's what I love. The truth never changes. So, I used to do interviews yeah. with guys a year or two later, and they couldn't remember <clears throat> the lies they would tell. And you'd catch them doing wildlife crimes just because they couldn't remember the lies they told a year ago. So, I think by being an open book, you're a better person for it because, yeah. You don't, you don't like, you tell the truth. That's always the same consistently. So. It's funny. Cause when I talk to people and we, it's a new relationship, you know, mm. uh, I just say, you're going to find, I repeat myself all the time because 
it's just the truth, mm. right? So I'll say it over and over again because I'll like the thing of making the world a better place one person at a time. That's what I the truth does. I just keep saying it because it's the truth, yeah. right? Like, so anyways, the, you know, it was, it's quite a journey um, that me and my dad had. Mm. And, um, you know, it went from him being my hero for half my life and then he got involved and kind of got bogged down in some drugs and alcohol and had a tough time there for a while. And our relationship wasn't the greatest typical father and son story, I guess. And, and, uh, and towards the end, it had gotten back on track the last, you know, four years or so. And, and, uh, and not like, you know, it was never adversarial. Like, well, it was never, it didn't, we didn't, I think we didn't talk one time for three months. Um, but outside of that, you know, Hey, a lot of therapy for me to try to figure out how to deal with that dynamic. Um, because when that's going on and people are involved in, uh, drugs and alcohol, it's just, uh, yeah, it just changes them. And at the end of the day, we all have our own shit, mm-hmm. right? We all have stuff that we're not good at, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and things that are, you know, some people have addiction problems. Some people have other problems. Whatever it is, we all got our own shit. Mm-hmm. And so the, the thing is not to judge people for uh, whatever their shit is. And um, so it, it was a rough transition through that period. And, and uh, the, the movie and the script tells some, cra- you know, some of these crazy stories. My dad was an old hippie. So, <laughs> so to tell you one of those crazy stories... Um, my dad was just free spirit thought, you know, he wanted to teach me everything. And, and, uh, so it's winter I'm 15 and, um, he comes out and goes, Hey, he goes, and we're living in Isle of Mott, Vermont, right? Farthest to the Champlain Islands, seven miles long, three miles wide population, 350 ish in the winter and like 2000 something in the summer with all the Canadian, uh, vacationers. Mm -hmm. So he comes out and goes, hey, he goes, I got to go to Waitsfield to the Bluetooth, which was this club um, that I'd sung at uh, when I was a kid and and followed him around to, right? I got to go there to pick up a quarter pound of pot. You want to come? You can drive. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I have. Oh, yeah. So I have my permit so I can drive for an hour and a half. You damn right. I want to go. Yeah. So we drive there and it's right around my birthday in December. So I'm, I, we drive all the way there and I'll, and it's funny cause I'll never forget walking in that place. It's in the daytime. It's closed. We walk in and, and my dad yells out hello with his, you know, smiley, you know, Jimmy T, you know, loves everybody voice. Mm-hmm. And the guy goes, Oh, Jimmy T he goes, yeah, man, I'll be right back. And he goes back in the back room and he comes out with his guitar case. Well, I'm like, Ooh, you know, he's got the weed in a guitar case. Wow. How cool is that? So the guy grabs a case and plops it up on the counter and I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm 15 and he opens the case up and it's a 69 gold top Les Paul, which is an antique, amazing guitar. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, he opens it up and I look at it and I got this, you know, confused look on my face and my dad says, happy birthday. Uh, Yeah. Which to me, was just like, oh yeah, you're just like, I mean, it's, it doesn't get much cooler than that. Yeah. So I still have that guitar to this day. Wow. From that. Yeah, my dad was a trip, man. All that to say, uh, he passed away a year and a half ago, um, massive heart attack. And we were, I was blessed that I called him. I was actually playing in Stowe, Vermont at the Rusty Nail. Huh. And it was like a 50th anniversary for them. It was literally on my birthday. And my dad was supposed to come. And I was all excited that he was going to set in. And it had all come full circle. And then it turned out that he was sick and he wasn't going to be able to make it. He had a cold. So I called him up on the way there. Great conversation. He's like, Hey man, you know, uh, I got your birthday present, you know, I, you know, and I was like, dad, you didn't, I, it's all good, man. You didn't have to get me anything. No, no, no. He goes, guess what it is. I'm like, I, I don't know. No, no, no. Guess what it is. I'm like, I don't know dad. He goes, well, it's something you can use. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, still don't know. He goes, strings, man, it's strings. <laughs> you know, and he's sick. So we have a great conversation. Tell him how much I love him. And uh, and that night, it was just one of those nights where the band, it was just, it was incredible. Band was awesome. All in the band, I love all the guys, right? They're, 
great dudes and so good to me and kind and 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 talented as shit right so we crushed it uh you know got done got out of there it's 1 32 a.m in the morning i had uh, uh these two sisters are friends of mine and we had rented uh, uh my best friend uh, one of my best friends and i were in one room and they were in another and and they got me some tequila and I don't party much like that anymore, but I was up all night drinking tequila. And it's funny about the time I went to bed, um, I, it come to be that my dad had passed away, you know, in the morning. And, uh, I got the call the next day and massive heart attack. And, uh, he just went and that was it when, when he was with his girlfriend. So, mm. yeah. So anyways, all that comes full circle and, the stories that take place in there. I'm on the road with him when I'm 17 and yeah, it's rock and roll. We're, we're, you know, traveling around playing shows and that's what I've done. And so all those stories from when I was a kid, you know, uh, you know, standing on a chair singing with him and singing proud (laughs) Mary and Jeremiah was a bullfrog, right? Joy to the world. (laughs) Yeah. So anyways, all that to say, we're supposed to start shooting that movie um this fall and this winter and it's exciting uh yeah. for all this working on it and uh to see i think we i think the director's perfect he gets it um and he's super excited about it and uh yeah so yeah it's a really cool thing and it's just you know hey man i'm just some podunk kid from vermont mm. right so that they're gonna do a movie on my life and uh i don't even know what to think about it other than it's exciting uh, I think it's really cool. And it definitely has some depth to it for someone to g- grasp that and get that. And, you know, just the relationship you're, with your father, I think, is out of that music, out of that lifestyle, uh, the stories that come out of it, the companionship, as well as the father and son relationship. Yeah. There, there, there's yeah. a lot of depth there. And I'm sure that's what they were seeing because I, I don't know if we have a lot of that depth anymore. Um, I, the stories are crazy. I mean, growing up like that. I can't even I mean, imagine. <laughs> yeah, you're talking, you know, 70s and 80s. We're talking, yeah, you know, free free love <clears throat> and no crazy <laughs> drugs back then, right? I'd mm-hmm. say for the most part. Like cocaine hadn't even come out too much, you know, early on. And so it was just weed and drinking and uh, just, you know, people having fun. It was just the the... Mm-hmm. It, it was a it was a time that <clears throat> I don't think will come back ever again uh, because if you back then if you wanted to play music you got a band together you hired an agent and they just put you on the road yeah it was as simple as that these days and and they would promote it these days people are like it became that all somehow everybody started playing for free right and it it was like okay well you want to play here well what's your crowd like. And it's like, well, how all does it all of a sudden is it my responsibility to bring in the crowd all the time? Mm. And it literally has switched, right? Mm. Because it used to be that the venues themselves, the just people just went there. Right. Right. There was a there was a club. That was in, the place to go. Because they A, they had good music. It was yeah. a good party atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was it was as simple as that. There was a couple bars in Burlington, Vermont. One was called Texas and one was called Club New England. And you know, people just, it was open. I think it was open six nights a week. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think it was Tuesday through Sunday, just closed on Mondays. And, uh, and Texas was the same, was the same thing. And it was just, that's just what it was. And that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny? (laughs) (laughs) It it is. It's very funny, but Hey, that's probably where you got some of your roots from and, and off you went to, uh, Nashville eventually. Uh, after you, after you traveled around, huh? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you know, my dad, uh, my mom, my dad, and my mom got divorced when I was in the. Uh, I don't know. We moved. It's around the sixth grade that I can remember. It may have been the fifth grade when they got divorced, and then we moved to Burlington, and and just uh, it was too much for me. Big city, uh, bullied when I was a kid, like in the sixth grade, and just like constantly. And so I went to live with my dad. The, the summer before my seventh grade year and then had to ask my mom if I could live with him. Mm-hmm. And so he had um, a girlfriend at the time who ended up being his second wife. And she, so he was on the road all the time. So he's playing every weekend. So she's taking care of me and she would go to her sister's 
and her sister lived in Charlotte and um, her sister was a rabid country music fan. So her sister was, um, her brother was, her brother was a huge Hank Jr. fan, you know, uh, a sister, big outlaws, that record, the outlaws, which was, I think it was the first country platinum record or uh, which had, you know, Willie Whalen, Tom Paul Glazier and Jesse Coulter. And, um, and she would go there on the weekends. <clears throat> and this is a true story. I'm not making any of this up. They would have um, a bonfire, small, just fire, right? Not like a bonfire, I guess just a fire next to the chicken coop <laughs> with, uh, uh, you know, lawn chairs and stumps to sit on, drinking Pap's Blue Ribbon beer. And, uh, you know, people around would be playing acoustic guitars and they're singing, you know, Good hearted woman, and you ain't woman enough to take my man. I mean, I'll never forget my end up being my stepmother, Maggie, next to me, you know, singing, and you ain't woman enough to take my man. Like, and I hated it. I was like, <laughs> what is wrong with these people? And it's funny, that must have, that must have worked this way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I, you know, I grew up on everything from, God, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Jim Croce, uh, Jerry Reed, Johnny Cash. I learned Johnny Be Good off of Buck Owens' record. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's when it went on from there to, you know, BTO and, and uh, you know, ACDC. And I got into different styles of music as time went on and, and uh, ZZ Top, as we had talked about before. So it's crazy how that stuff embedded itself. So when I was, I had my own top 40 band in the eighties and I was writing songs and they were country songs. Mm. And it just occurred to me that if I was going to get where I'm going, I was never going to get there playing somebody else's songs. So right. I quit a band where we were touring the East coast in Nova Scotia and, um, started, I ended up doing my first record, um, stopped into this guy's house in, uh, Troy, Vermont guy by the name of Wayne Warner. And he owned this Warner's dance hall. And I don't know if I stopped in there to try to get a gig or what it was, but stopped into his house in the afternoon um, on a Sunday after I had played the weekend. And we ended up hitting it off and stayed up all night long, drinking and telling stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, he became uh, just one of my best friends. And I did my first record there. Uh, he had a recording studio. Huh. I did my first record there for free. Yeah. I mean, I've had so many... It, it's fun to, to, to talk to people um, such as yourself because I go through these stories and I think how blessed I've been, right? Yes. That that guy, without him, none of this would have been what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, he literally allowed me to do, record anything I wanted and he wanted to help me. And he obviously did, you know, uh, immensely. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how uh, it, it started there and ended up going to... Uh, LA to do a record with a guy named Charlie Midnight, which this Martine Gigi set up, right? So that's back in the mid nineties. Mm. So it's funny how that comes. We're talking about circles again. Yeah. Well, that comes full circle. And now he's fixing to be the director of this movie, you know, yeah. crazy. So, and Charlie Midnight wrote living in America for James Brown. And um, he had songs on the bodyguard soundtrack. He produced the Doobie brothers, Joe Cocker, and and still has gone on to have, an amazing career and he's just amazing straight up guy a rarity in the music business <laughs> so yeah went on from there moved to nashville did a did another record um started did that here moved here met a guy named greg brown who produced travis tritt's first five records within days after i moved here mm. and uh and then here we are ended up getting a record deal with warner brothers and wrote songs and lost the record deal never got released and got a few other record deals and that didn't work out and here I am yeah. <laughs> getting ready to do a movie in the fall, right? Yeah, and and all that comes to play for that movie because it's it's a roller coaster. Uh, you've had a roller coaster. <laughs> you, we, yeah, we were talking before we started about how you know that for artists, you know, I, definitely for me, the highs are much higher and the lows are much lower. Mm. So we've talked about how I suffer from depression. I have since I was, you know, I remember it and started and. At, at the very least in high school. Mm -hmm. And I just remember I didn't like school and just, yeah. So uh, as time went on, you know, the depression was a, you know, you could get really down. Like, so when you're on stage and you're playing and everybody's, you know, I've walked on stage before where they are, um, 
they're screaming so loud it hurts your ears right <laughs> and you're like which is it's one of the greatest things in the world right mm. i'm so indebted to all of those people mm. every single one of them that was doing that right they don't even know they just think they're having a great time they don't know they're making my life right, right. They're fulfilling a dream and so those highs the adrenaline hangover the next day is worse than any tequila hangover. I say <laughs> not worse because those tequila hangovers can be bad. I would know. Um, but the adrenaline hangover is rough the next day. Right. Oh, I seem to have uh, – hold on because I'm going to have to reboot my video. Okay. Yeah. There you go. So uh, all that to say, those highs are incredible. Mm -hmm. And when you, know, when you get the phone call that you just lost your, your record deal, which was – um, that, that's not the phone call you lost your record deal so no <laughs> it's funny because everything shut off i don't know why uh, maybe i should turn my phone off off i don't know why it's uh, ringing but anyways um when you get that call that you lost your record deal that's just a tough gig man and uh we uh, talked about it it's just everybody's got their own stuff and in my my life you know it is what it is it's mm -hmm. all relative right but that that day. makes a good movie jamie lee yeah, it should be. Uh, I'm yeah. excited about Let's where it's going. I mean, those ups and downs, those roller coaster roads are, you know, what people engage when because it gives them hope too. It watches they watch you go in your highs and lows, and it gives them hope because they may be in a low, and they're heading for a high. It, it's that up point. That's yeah, dude. You're yeah, Wayne. You're all over it, my friend. Because yeah. again, I don't. You know, you don't look at yourself like that, right? That you may. It's be hard to look in. It really else. is. It's hard to look in because, let's face it, you try to be humble. Been taught all our lives to be humble, and it's hard to, to look in. So we don't. We don't. We don't generally look in. We we look out. But every now and then, we 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 got to look in, and we got to lock on those things. And some of the things you've you've said that are so important. And I learned this. I went to counseling too after a shooting incident, and I didn't think I needed to go. But the thing I grasp onto there is healthy people get help. Healthy people get help, which, you know, to this day, that, the, you know, and counseling back in your, your day when you're talking about it was probably had the stigma is the same when I went to counseling. You know, we, we, you weren't supposed to get counseling. You know, we're tough guys. You know, you look like a pretty rugged dude. Oh, uh, you don't need no counseling. <laughs> well, it, it, isn't that funny? Because uh, with anything else, and I love that healthy people get help. Yes. With anything else, if you want to, if I want to learn a guitar, I'm going to go to a guitar, somebody who's a badass guitar player. If mm -hmm. I want to learn how to build a deck because I'm going to build decks, I'm going to go to somebody who's built a gazillion decks and is a badass deck builder. So why isn't it if you want to learn about life, you're going to go to somebody who has studied it and, um, is a counselor that's talked to so many people and learned so many things about life that they can teach you that will help you. Right. Mm -hmm. How is it that you're, because nobody can know all this shit. No. Right. Nobody knows like, and these counselors, at least with mine, she saved my ass. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think she saved my life. I, I could say the same with mine. Yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, what's funny is, is your thing, uh, was a shooting incident and my thing was something totally different. But at the end of the day, and I've said this because uh, I've done a lot of work with vets, mm -hmm. right? A long time ago, <clears throat> short story. Uh, my, uh, a girl I was dating's brother went to Iraq and when he got back and it was the first Iraq. And when he got back, I asked him what it was like. He goes, I can't even, he goes, the sand, it's hot. And he was a medic and he said, the things that he's seen, he couldn't unsee that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So, before we knew about post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, I was with, you know, I wrote songs every day and I was with a friend of mine was like, I want to write a song about what happens when you come back. Mm. And we didn't have a title. And, uh, you know, and the, the original lyrics was he drinks whiskey and takes it with cocaine. Mm. Right. And we changed it and takes pills to kill the pain and wrote that. And it sat around. This is another case of be careful of, of letting people tell you what's good and what's not good. Because I had a manager who was like, eh, yeah, eh, I don't really like it. And then years later, <clears throat> we I wasn't working with him anymore. And I, um, I said, I'm going to put that on a record. And I did. And it just kind of took a life of its own, right? And mm -hmm. you learn about being able to help people right? Well, through that type of thing. So anyways, we ended up writing this song. 
and and it took on a life of its own. And these vets really, because it, the I'll never forget, I was uh, at a softball game. My girlfriend was playing at the time, and I just got it. I was like, it's ghosts in his eyes. That's the problem. He's got all these ghosts that he can't get rid of, and it's all that trauma in your head, right? Mm-hmm. And so we wrote the song and, and um, you know, started doing stuff to help vets. And, you know, I ended up on MSNBC and Fox and, um, and there's another network too, another big network doing interviews on this stuff and uh, helping out a nonprofit. And through that, I've been able to touch a lot of vets and have conversations with them. And, and it gets back to exactly what I was saying to you is it doesn't matter how you get to the dark place. It just that you know the dark place, Mm -hmm. right? And so with these guys, I could go, hey, man, I I don't know what it's like to be you. I don't know what got you there. I'm not you, but I know that dark place. Mm -hmm. And so through that, they open up. And and, uh, it's interesting that um, how you can get in there, and then it comes back to the thing of how we can get out, right? Mm -hmm. You you know, talk to people. Healing things, music, the outdoors, those are things that, you know, counselors have a tendency, you know, working out. <clears throat> so you, you burn up that inside energy, uh, those, those types of things. But music is a big key to therapy and being able to expose those things through, you know, a, a song is just, uh, that's good. That's getting it out, Jamie. That's, that's, and sometimes that's getting it out for someone that they can't put words to it. Right. They can't get it out themselves. Yeah. Right. And they go, hey that's because i've had so many you know guys go that's me man Mm -hmm. and you're just i get chills thinking about it now Mm -hmm. right because i'm you know you just do what you do and and uh when you touch people like that hey man i'm just some podunk kid from waterbury center vermont (laughs) right like uh that i can have an impact like that on people special yeah and it's still it seem it's surreal and doesn't seem real right Mm -hmm. Um, like you said, we never see ourselves as other people see us. We're looking from the inside out. They're looking from the outside in. They see all those things that we'll never be able to see about ourselves. Um, unless you said we're having a conversation like this and, and I can get a glimpse because you'll say stuff and I'll, it'll actually, you know, I'll actually be able to look inside and see it. And, uh, it, yeah, it's an amazing thing. So I, I, I don't know if I've said this, but I sure appreciate you having me on too. And you, <clears throat> are a tremendous guy yourself. You're just a great dude. So well, no I, wonder everybody's downloading this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll keep charging away. And I just kind of want to, cause you know, the people that listen to your music are the same people that listen to my podcast, whether we call them rednecks, whether we call them the rule bunch, whether we call them, you know, the guys that love the outdoors and you being from Vermont. I mean, I could just see you in the green check cause every Vermonter wears green check. And uh, when they're hunting, <laughs> Uh, you might have to open a show like that sometime in Vermont because <laughs> no one else will get it. Okay, part? Jamie Lee, <laughs> no, no you one else are will get 100% it. Hundred percent right. <laughs> when I when I grew up and could afford it, mm-hmm. I went and bought all Johnson Woolen Mills yep. green check, green check, absolutely. I, I still wear it to this day, and they, people look at me like because <laughs> stuff has moved on from that. I'm well, like, yeah, no, except in Vermont. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. In Vermont, it, it's still pretty much green check. Uh, Is it? Yeah, that's oh, me. When those hunters come over from Vermont, I, I can tell them. There's a few New Hampshire people that wear the green check, but a Vermonter, guaranteed 90% of the green checks are are good. And we're talking, yeah, wool jackets and green that's checks. Me. and uh, it, it's When definitely... I grew up, hunting was, like deer hunting mm-hmm. was the biggest thing. Like mm-hmm. I followed my dad around and I would go, I would just go stand because I, I wasn't allowed to uh, have a gun until I was 12. And I went through the hunter safety course, of course, and Mm -hmm. um, got a, it's funny because once I was old enough, you know, my dad was like, okay, I'm going to give you a 410. It was 410 single shot with a slug. Mm. And I was like, well, I want a 12 gauge. And he goes, "Eh, I think that's a little too much for you. And he goes, I think it's too much for you. And I go, oh, no, no, I can handle it. And he goes, okay, you think so? So we go out in the woods and, uh, as I put it up to my shoulder, I didn't put, I put it here and not here so much. Yeah. <laughs> little well, low on the bicep, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what happens next. Yeah. You uh, went right back to that 410. <laughs> yeah. Boom. I'm on my ass. 
I'm like, okay, I may have, uh, I may have over wanted there for a second. Of course, had a black and blue mark here for you know, God knows how long. The 410 was great, but I was now with the dudes, right? So, right, you know, our family had deer camps, and you know, everybody would put their guns outside, and uh, you know, if it's not obviously freezing, freezing cold, and, and right. uh, I got to hang around with yeah. the adults, right? I'm now a hunter. Yes, quote unquote, that rite of passage. Yeah, and from then, like my dad would take me, you know, uh, uh, partridge hunting, and he always hunted partridge with a single shot, twelve gauge. Mm -hmm. Like my dad was a badass shot. So, yeah. Oh, there's deer jacking stories the whole nine yards. He's an outlaw. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. There's it, one where, there's one where uh, um, it's pouring rain, and of course, you know, we ate everything and and i don't know if it's because we were poor at the time or if it was because my dad was just an outlaw um but the the story you know you always hear the stories right and you wonder if they're true because my dad was telling it mm. and how it was pouring rain you know and he saw this doe up on the hill and yeah it was 100 yards away and it was you know single shot um single shot 410 slug you know shoots and uh drops it right and so years later you're like okay of course they go get it blah 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 mm -hmm. you bring it back to my dad's house and my mom you know i was like what are you doing she's pissed and <laughs> but she loved the deer heart so he goes but i got a deer heart well that calmed her down for a little bit and i remember <laughs> her boiling the deer heart that whole thing years later the cousin that was with him i'll never forget this time he goes we're driving. He goes, it's pouring rain. And you know, your dad see, tells the story exactly like my dad did. And I was like, so it's true. It's it is true. true. <laughs> oh my God. So <clears throat> all that to say, just grew up hunting all my life and lived in Isle of Mont and, and uh, duck hunted and, and uh, God duck uh, goose hunted all every year um, from the eighth grade, mm. you know, straight up through until a few years ago, um, it got to be difficult to get up and back. So I haven't for a while. Um, but, but just hunting was such a big part of, you know, my life because there's something about being in the woods to where it's quiet. It's just you. I liked hunting by myself a lot. Yeah. I'm going wherever I want to go. I'm doing my own thing. You know, yeah, I want to get a deer and yeah, I've been lucky enough to, to get a few, um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's about being in the woods, mm -hmm. right? It's about, and I've learned a lot too. I got a, there was this one deer, it was huge track. We had seen him and he had a big rack on him. And I had, you know, I had friends that would track deer and just dog them and, you know, they would eventually get them and yada, yada, yada. So I'm in Waterbury center. I'm up on Shaw Mansion road and it's, you know, a uh, hunger mountain is right there. And then across the road, it goes down into what we call the, the brook hole, and it's, it's just, you know, it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, that's it. I am, I'm going to fucking dog that track and I'm on it. Like I'm going. And I did, I followed it up the mountain and it would come back down and go back down across the road, back down into this ravine and back down up. And well, this went on for hours. And so after a while I'm drenched, I'm exhausted. And I, and I looked and even when you're down into the brook hole, you still, as it's on this, they still have things that would go down here and up on the other side. Mm -hmm. I was like, Little ravines. And I was following it. Well, I was starting to lose the resolve, shall we say. <laughs> and I, if that, I go, if he goes down and back up one more time, I am out. Screw him. I don't give a shit anymore. And that's exactly what happened. That was my, uh, yeah, so ever since then, I've never been pretty much the tracker, shall we say. <laughs> 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 I've been there and done the exact same thing, even with my father, as that as the deer did the third time up and down the mountain. I'm, and he's like, "Are we going up again?" I'm like, "No way, I'm done." You know, when you're walking through a foot of snow, and I just, uh, you, you won, you won, you you can live yeah. another day. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, right. Like, I'm out. You gotta Go get ahead, in I'm shape. Done. So, but yeah, that, that, you know, people don't understand if you don't do it with that whole outdoor experience, it's not about just killing deer. It's about the family experience. It's about being in the outdoors. It's about being in your own thoughts and experiencing nature by yourself. I mean, great place to put those things in your head about songs and, and things like that. You know, here's what I say about, um, uh, people who 
and I and I get it, right? And again, I'm not judging anybody. Everybody's got their own thoughts, mm-hmm. beliefs, whatever. As long as uh, as long as you don't turn into an asshole, you know. Yeah. And, and again, you're trying to make the world a better place, one person at a time. Mm-hmm. Whatever. And it's it, it's their life, not right. mine. So all that to say, I was coming around the corner, coming back from rehearsal one night in Essex. Um, uh, I was on the river road from Richmond to Essex and I came around the corner and there was uh does across the entire road mm. and it was around the corner. So there was no way that I wasn't going to hit something, one of them. Mm. So I just aimed for the biggest hole and unfortunately, you know, hit a doe, um, the rear left hind quarter spun around, hit my truck and it ended up in the ditch and, and, Seeing that deer suffer like that, and because I ended up, <laughs> you'll love this story. This is this is where you ha- you can't let the uh, you can't let doing the right thing get the best of you because sometimes you do the right thing and you get punished for it, which is what happened here. Sunday night, there's no game warden on duty. It's rural Vermont, and back in the '90s, um, probably early to mid '90s, and so you have to call the state police. So I go to my cousin's house, call the state police go back down so that I can be there, you know, and the, the poor deer is in the ditch and it's suffering. And that, that tore me up because I hate seeing that. Mm-hmm. And he gets there and he doesn't really know. Um, you know, I'm just like, just put your gun behind her ear and just put her out of her misery because she's suffering because mm-hmm. she couldn't move. So he did. And he comes back out and he looks and sees that my vehicle's uninspected and my windshield has a crack on it and gives <laughs> me a ticket unexpected view. <laughs> you believe that shit? <laughs> yeah, that's that is a true story. Oh. Anyways, to those, you know, to people who don't quite understand hunting, I just always offer that and say, you have to keep the deer population down or else that's going to happen more, more deer are going to suffer and I I've been lucky enough to where the deer I've shot are, are pretty much one and done, one and down. Right. Right. So it's much better, in my opinion, for that than it is to hit deer and have them suffer that way. Just mm. it was it was extremely traumatic and uh, a huge learning experience for me um, when it came to hunting and that type of stuff. So nice. Um, yeah, and just getting out in the woods. I find that if I don't do that, this past year I wasn't able to go up because of COVID and places to stay and all that kind of stuff that when you don't get out to do that, it, it affects me. Mm-hmm. Right. For some reason, just that couple weeks of being able to be out there and just walk and, and it's just a totally different thing. It takes a couple days for everything to calm down to where you can get in that mode. No doubt. Um, but just being in the woods is an amazing thing. Although I think I haven't gotten a deer for, I don't know, last couple, two, three years. And I'm like, okay, this whole being in the woods thing, I'm all about that, <laughs> and I love that. But I kind of want to get a deer too at this point. I yeah. need some, you know, need some deer meat in my world. So, no doubt, no doubt that that's that's the end goal. But getting there, the journey to get that deer is, is just as much fun. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't all do it for sure because we all can't get them. No, I'm tested to. I'm a test of that. I got. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I got friends of mine that get deer every year. And one of my friends, he's a, his name's Todd. He's a he lives in Hyde Park now, I think, but he's from Waterbury. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he we call him Toddy. And every year, man, he's just he goes up, dogs him, gets him. You know, like the old Benoit brothers. Yes. Right. Yep. You, have you ever heard of them? Oh yeah, I've met them. They, <clears throat> that, yep. They they ran away with well, they fueled up one time and their car didn't work, so my trooper buddy actually stopped them in my area too. And they were on their way to Maine to hunt. So, but they hunt New Hampshire, they hunt Maine, they hunt and they'd get a deer and they move, move on. But, you know, you know, tracking family for sure. They wrote books, they had videos. Uh, yeah, there there was some, yeah, they are well known in the Northeast, probably throughout the country actually as trackers and, uh, yeah, all those Benoits. So yeah, we would, uh, every year we, my, my, uh, mom's family, was from Waitsfield. So we lived in Waterbury. So we'd go from Waterbury to Waitsfield, which would drive right by their house. And it was mm-hmm. a big deal to see 
all the deer hanging up with the giant racks every right. time we'd go by. Oh my God. You know, with a kid, you're just like, Oh my God. Mm-hmm. That was cool stuff back in the day. Yeah. They transformed deer hunting really in the Northeast. Uh, you know, with, I mean, almost every <laughs> Vermonter is a tracker. They love to track and, it, and it's that start of the Benoits that started that love of tracking from Vermonters and, and as well as New Hampshire and getting that in. There were so many people tracking. They have them cutting tracks now. So they'll see a guy on a track, you know, he took that track. Well, let me go up to the next crossroad, see if I can get ahead of him, but still have the deer track. And they'll jump on the deer track there, and that poor guy is hiked up through, goes to the next woods road, and someone else has grabbed the track. <laughs> That's why I am not a tracker. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm fine the right place, and I just get charged charge just seeing them. Mm, right? Yes. When they come out, like, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I can't look too far into it other than that excitement. Oh. Uh, to when you're sitting there and just, just, yeah. And it's all about, you know, being comfortable. I've learned that mm-hmm. you don't try to sit somewhere where it's not comfortable. No. Cause you're not sitting still for very long. No, make yourself at home. And my son, you know, this year he was on his phone, which he was actually remotely in a class one day he was hunting with me and his instructor knew it too. He's like, I hope you miss a deer because you're remotely in school while you're hunting. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was, it was pretty that's, entertaining. <laughs> that's the that's the essential, uh, or the uh, uh, not the essential, but that's the epitome of the uh, multitasking, huh? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> a- a- absolutely. And I, I I was proud of him, so we 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 got it done. And it was funny because he's on it, and I I saw a deer, and I I put deer, and the next thing I and I watch him, and all of a sudden his phone drops, and his head's on a swivel. Boom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he goes into that yeah, mode. Pick, <laughs> yeah, we can pick that up later. That's right. That's right. So, hey, what's your favorite song? Do you have a favorite? I mean, there's a few. Not really. Like when we talk about LaGrange, to me, never gets old. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, stuff that pops in my head is Jailhouse Rock by Elvis. I was talking I think- about your stuff. <clears throat> oh. Fame or, uh, a favorite when it comes Jamie to me- Lee Thurston <clears throat> song. I don't necessarily, I got favorites. Like I wrote a song, like I've written a few great songs. Mm-hmm. One of them is called Dance Around the Truth that I wrote with a friend of mine named Tommy Connors, who's just an amazing songwriter. And uh, we wrote it backwards. Um, we the, the, So the verse, anyways, he we were supposed to write with another friend of ours, Stuart Harris, and Stuart ended up being a mentor and like a stepdad to me. So Stuart Harris wrote, I'm going to be somebody. He's had nine number ones. I'm going to be somebody of a Travis Tritt. And mm-hmm. can I trust you with my heart? Drift off to dream. And no one else on earth. Winona and, and uh, Waylon's last number one called Rose in Paradise. And so he was supposed to write with us and he had to cancel. So it was just me and Tommy. So I went to Tommy's house and he was strumming this. It's straight up country too. And he gets to the end of it and he goes, dance around that. And I thought he said, I goes, did you, I said, did you just say dance around the tree? <laughs> He said, no, it's dance around the truth. I was like, oh, okay, that's much better because I didn't think we were going anywhere. And we started from the line that leads into the first chorus and wrote our way back up, as odd as that sounds. Usually, mm. obviously, you write from the top down or, or you right. write a, a chorus and then you write verses. Or Yeah. That's one of my favorite songs. There's a, there's some other stuff. That's a good that game written. warden song too. I like that because uh, I saw a lot of that dancing around the truth. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and they uh, they dance around the truth like they've uh, like they got uh, you know I don't know bees in their underwear or something, right? <laughs> You've seen it too, well, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, dude. Well, what's up? What are you looking at? What deer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What oh, turkey? I've heard story. You know, I'm always on the other end, right? For, so me, like, uh, I'm always on the other end, and you hear as a hunter, mm-hmm. you know, that there's there's fake deer out there, and it's like there are. Yeah. Well, don't go shooting. <laughs> don't go shooting out of you dumbass. <laughs> right? And there are people out there that just, you know, they everywhere. There's there's good and there's bad, right? Yeah. So there's good cops, bad cops, Absolutely. good people, bad people, uh, good hunters, bad hunters. Absolutely. It just is the way it is. And at the end of the day, some of the bad hunters, it's like, why you gotta like, why are you out trying to jack all these deer? Like, what about the hunters that want, you know, because you're ruining it for everybody. Mm-hmm. It, in my, I just, I'm, yeah, 
that doesn't suit well for me. So when those guys get caught, I'm like, good asshole. Mm-hmm. Like you're not, if you were doing it cause you needed to feed your family to me and you're starving. Right. Uh, that's one thing. But if you're doing it just because you're doing it and you're, you know, and you, whatever, then that's bullshit. Right. In this day and age, there's road kills. There's other ways to do it. But, and some of these poachers are pretty likable people, actually. They're, they're, and they're entertaining. They're, they're likable. And, you know, I, I had one called Poacher Haynes. That's, that's really what people call him, Poacher <laughs> Haynes. That's his, that's his nickname. And no one knows him really. It's Harry Haynes, but they call him Poacher. That's, that's been, I don't know how long he's had that nickname, but that's his name. Very likable guy. He said, Wayne, you ever catch me? I'll, I'll just own up to it. So... I never did catch him though. Other people have. <laughs> he got caught other times. So <laughs> well, if you ever catch me, I'll just own up to it. And yeah. It's like, okay, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's something about that. You kind of got to respect the yeah, guy, I, right? Yeah, I do. I do. I yeah. do. So, no. Poacher Haynes. Poacher Haynes. Um, <laughs> one of these days, I'll have to see if he he'll talk to me so I can do the poacher segments. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, we need T-shirts that say Poacher Haynes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get a profile on there, too, because he's got quite the profile. <laughs> oh, I bet he does at this point. He looks yeah. like he's from Vermont. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because Vermont and New Hampshire are pretty, I mean, Very similar. pretty close. Absolutely. Yeah, with the exception of New Hampshire gets a little, you know, they're obviously uh, closer to the coast in some some on the isn't Portsmouth on the coast? It is. Too? It is. We got 13 miles of coast, so it's it's pretty yeah. sweet from okay. Hampton Beach all the way up to Portsmouth, and you know some very busy coast actually. I didn't realize how busy we were because we we bring in a lot of fish. There's a couple uh, commercial fishery fisheries that we actually bring into port and stuff. So it's yeah, it's a very busy coast considering you know how the length of Massachusetts is in Maine as well. So our 13 miles is very active. Yeah, and I've, you know, obviously just uh, touring and traveling around, mm. uh, playing cl- clubs back in the 80s and 90s and, you know, had a girlfriend that lived in Maine and, and uh, Augusta before, so I would take Route 2. Oh, boy. Um, Drove right by, yeah. to, right through my area. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, Lancaster is about 30 minutes from me, so you went oh. right through Lancaster. Yeah, uh, yeah, so many times. So Good many thing I'm times. not Poacher Thurston. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have met under <laughs> under not, <different. laughs> yeah under different not so great circumstances. That's right. That's right. Uh, I've been through yeah, and going through the the mountains, you mm, know, they're just gorgeous there. It I don't is know gorgeous. if are those mountains bigger than than the Vermont mountains? I think it they is. Are, yep, they? the whites are higher than the greens for sure. So yeah. when the green mountains have trees on top, generally speaking, and the whites are treeless because of the weather we get, where three weather fronts merge at the same place in the white mountains. And, you know, little 4,000 footers don't grow trees because of the weather and the wind. And of course, we have Mount Washington with the world's worst weather and the, and the top speed of 212 miles an hour, I believe. Uh, oh, seriously? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 it's the fastest recorded. Maybe it's the second now. Maybe they've recorded faster winds on the planet, but it's it's like the the first or second fastest recorded winds on the planet have been on Mount Washington. Of course, there's a weather station on top, so that helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other mountains aren't getting recorded quite the same. JB Lee. <laughs> it definitely helps with data, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I was in Colorado. I was out in uh, um, out in Boulder and Denver a few weeks ago, and the thing that I noticed is. You know, I've always thought that those mountains were so much bigger and higher than, um, and I'm sure they are to a certain extent, but the other, they are, but the, the, the difference is they start at a higher elevation right. when they go up, mm-hmm. right? They do. I, it's, it's not like it's 7,000 feet, um, from, you know, like, it's not like, I don't know, uh, Mount Mansfield's what, 3,400 feet, something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's. You know, they start at the same place and then it's thirty four hundred feet, right? Right. Um, or they start at the same place and it's eight thousand feet. Right. So I noticed that out there. They're still obviously they're higher, but they start the elevation starts higher, higher. when it moves up. So which I Looked thought was out. interesting. Yeah. Beautiful out there too. I went hiking, uh, uh, hiking in uh, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. I think. Awesome. Yeah, I saw. I got some video of um, turkeys uh doing the dance mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and they got close enough where they didn't they didn't run. They didn't. Yeah, they well they were too busy worrying about getting laid. Right? It's, like <laughs> it's like a buck. I've heard so many stories about you know bucks. You know when it comes to deer and bucks when it comes to humans, they're pretty close when they're in rut. <laughs> right because because uh, i know that's all the I, males can think about yeah like i had a, like there was a giant like 10 pointer that my friend got can, can you imagine if bucks got to drink <laughs> <laughs> would that be trouble huh they're fighting as is <laughs> And the sober buck would run off with the dough. <laughs> yeah, you win for the statement of the day right there. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine if bucks were drinking alcohol and you just go, oh, my God, no. There's no, got to be a far side like that. <laughs> they, I've had friends tell stories about, and I've seen them too, the bucks, where they're, they're going after the dough. They're not even mm-hmm. worried about that you're there. Could care less. At all. And mm-hmm. how many times have we seen humans do that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> the dough, they don't care about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Can yeah. you imagine if bucks could drink? <laughs> yeah. There might be a song. Now, that would be a song right oh, there. Man. Yeah. We'd, we we could, uh, yeah, what's his name? We'd maybe put Poacher Haynes in there. Put Poacher Haynes in there. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about the deer bellying up to the bar. Oh, they're man. Already, yeah, they're already in heat and stupid as it is. Yeah. Oh, no. This has been an awesome conversation, and I knew it would be from our previous conversations. Uh, and I always try to give the last word to you, too. Uh, you know, anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to cover. We talked about your music. We talked about your movie, which I'm I'm wicked excited to see. Uh, I'm, I'm excited, especially getting this, you know, this prelude into your life. Uh, I think it's going to be a dynamic uh, story. Uh, yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's been a, I started looking through all the stages of my life. And, mm. uh, yeah. That roller and, coaster. Hey, I, I bet, I bet everybody's got interesting parts of their life. Um, mine was just a little more colorful just because of the, I don't know, the root. I guess if I was a salmon swimming upstream, uh, uh, my, uh, my river and I don't know, maybe more a few couple more twists and turns and waterfalls to jump up and over or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, all that to say, yeah, I'm I'm extremely excited about that. I'm if I was more on top of it and had my artist sheet and everything that I should talk about, um, I mean I'm excited for, you know, the videos that I've done, but before um it was at the beginning of this was it beginning of this year that it came out or the end of last year um i had a song that i wrote a while ago called it can all be gone Mm -hmm. and uh there's a video out there of it and uh it's pretty again i'm a no bullshit kind of guy and we worked on this video and it's pretty you know pretty real about bombings and shootings and you know the things that human beings do to each other Mm -hmm. i still it blows my mind that uh you know people are killing each other over money and mm-hmm. land and right. you know that kind of stuff just doesn't make any sense to me I, mm-hmm. i'm more of a let's make the world a better place and be kind you know one person at a time and you can't a lot of people can do blanket stuff well this person if this person believes you know well whatever if they're a democrat all democrats are assholes all republicans are assholes that doesn't exist mm-hmm. No such thing. Every person can't be an asshole. That's so. For sure. I would encourage people to try not to hold on to that. And at the end of the day, just try to be nice, right? Um, anyways, this this video really gets to the heart of it. Where it is, you know, I just want to see someone stand up and tell the truth, not analyze or justify. It ain't that hard to do. And with the uh, with the invention of the internet, and how things have taken off, <clears throat> it's crazy how misinformation and disinformation of shit that's just not true and people how they spread that right all facets everywhere spreading and you can have videos of people that are say one thing and they'll sit there and tell you they didn't mm-hmm. and it's uh to me i just wasn't brought up like that right right my dad was like hey if you do something and it's you you do wrong when i was a kid he'd say and you come and tell me i'm not going to kick your ass 
But boy, if you lie to me and I find out that's not the case, you're going to get it twice as bad. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've been more towards that. So any, anyways, I'm real proud of the work we did on that and what that song says. And I'm excited for, you know, to start, to, just started booking some shows and getting yeah. out of this. COVID's been a tough year, man, no for doubt. entertainment people. You know, mm-hmm. you don't, we survive on, you know, guys like you going, Hey man, you know, g- listening and just saying nice things about the music. And cause I don't sit around and think about that. I think about what I haven't done, right. You know, and how I should be better. Yeah. So the next one. Yeah. And you haven't got, we don't get any of that reinforcement of somebody, you know, coming up going, Hey man, I like your song or, or mm-hmm. being around those people. And so I'm super excited. Yeah. Uh, that to, to book some shows and, and to get out and play some more. And then one day at a time, man, I try not to look too far ahead and, uh, and just, you know, work to be happy right mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And I am super appreciative of you. I mean, you, you just been a super great guy. Uh, great dude to talk to somebody that when I get up that way, let me know have a beer sometime and carry on these conversations. Absolutely. That'd be a lot of fun. And, and continued success for you. And thank you for doing what you do. Right. And thanks for having me on here because you give me a chance to reflect and feel better about myself today. Right. And and you'll never know how much I appreciate that, which brings us back those circle things again to, you never know how small thing like this, this podcast and having me on can affect me and uh make me have a better day right right and better to be able to look at stuff and get off this podcast write another song (laughs) (laughs) we just need need a name for the deer (laughs) you know now all i could picture him of is a bar and all these bucks just sitting there drinking staggering out you know and and the hunters just stand there they don't even care they're just (laughs) They're just smelling the does. That's going, right. Oh, yeah. Dead eyes, uh, shoot me. I don't care. If it comes between, I'm going to die or I'm going to get laid. I'm going to try to get laid. If That's I die right. getting it, oh, what the hell? That's I great. Guess- I guess that's pretty much all I got to say. Yeah. Like, uh, and I want to put a special thanks out there for Jennifer Belanger for making us, c- connecting us. Eventually, you definitely are a moving target, uh, but we eventually connected. But thanks for her for making that connection because uh, it was a dynamic yeah. conversation. I really enjoyed it. I think all my listeners are going to love uh, that connection to country music because uh, I would say most of them are country. And, and if they aren't, guess what? I bet they will be by the time this podcast is, is over. Yeah, there's some great stuff out there. And I, I'm, you know, well, the music that I play, it's, again, it's, uh, uh, I think the only thing I didn't say is it's it's real, you know. Mm. Like, uh, when I say it's real, it's real to me, right? Like, I wrote a song called Dear God that uh, it was I, in my, you know, depression stage where I wasn't doing well at all and was having a hard time, you know, with Warner Brothers and wrote this song one day called Dear God that was basically a conversation, you know. Dear God, uh, remember me. Sorry, been so out of touch. Hope you haven't given up type kind of thing. And it yeah. ends up where it's happy at the end. But, you know, and it literally says in it, and I'm afraid of what I might do, right? Because, you know, when you get depressed, you have those thoughts at times. Mm-hmm. So stuff, it's real. I've written some love songs that are uh, about specific people and, and uh, actually just started dating this this lady that I'm – crazy about i've been single for a long long time and and uh yeah compelled to write a song about her cool. um, yeah yeah it's just it's again if we can take life one day at a time man try mm. not to eat the the whole cow in one bite right just yeah. uh i didn't bring this up before but it kind of struck me funny that you were watching your your girlfriend play softball and you came up with uh the lyrics about the ghosts in his head i'm like he really wasn't watching the softball game. <laughs> no, I'm talking to my friend on the phone. I'm talking to my co-writer. And, she, and just so you know, I was, she was madder than a hornet. I bet. That's I, all I know, could do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's like, you, you know, you can't ever disengage from that thing. You always got that phone here. You're, you're always blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. You're good pickup right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had to bring it up here at the end. We, we spoke about this girl. So hopefully if she plays softball, you'll watch the game. <laughs> 
And that's when you know it'll be the right one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I see now, like, no, oh, JLT, you think she's the one? It's like, dude, all I can tell you is she had a softball game, and I could not get there early enough, and I could not pay more attention. I wasn't even drinking. No, like, wait, wait, wait. The Bucks took watching. all my booze. <laughs> oh, man. That is awesome. The yeah. beer drinking bucks. Beer drinking bucks. Boy, wouldn't that be a scene? <laughs> it's got to be a far side out there on that. <laughs> <laughs> They're done. Far side, some of my favorite of all time. Oh man, that was just awesome. I I, I love looking at those <laughs> to this day. Their their incorporation of animals and uh, just the scenes like uh, where the bear get tagged and collared, and she's like, "Where have you been?" And he's got a big old ga- ear tag in his ears and a collar around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> he might have got Where into have the been? booze before that too who knows yeah yeah where have you been i don't know i swear i didn't have anything to drink but next thing i knew i felt a little pinch you know? i'd tell you but you never pinch. believe me yeah <laughs> it all this started awesome. i met this buck in the woods <laughs> and he had a bottle <laughs> Oh, we better end it. We better end it, Jamie Lee. Thank, thank you so much for being a, a guest on the Thin Green Line. Thanks so, thanks so much for having me, Wayne. This was awesome, and uh, I'll give you a shout. You know, what, do you ever make it up to Vermont at all? Oh, absolutely. I'm. Yeah, I mean, Vermont's a teeny little state, man. I can be there in 15 minutes, actually. So that's yeah. how close I live to the border. <laughs> Well, you're near Lancaster, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. I hit uh, Gill Hall. The you know the Northeast Kingdom is literally 15 minutes away from me. Um, well, I'm doing a show on July 4th in Essex, <clears throat> Essex, Vermont. So sweet. If you find yourself up that way, just let me know, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll give you the royal red car- red carpet treatment. I, I might have to end up there. <laughs> oh God, I'll tell you to. Uh, I don't know about the white hot star and all that matter sucking in stuff, but I can tell you that I haven't done a live show in, in uh, over a year. And you're ready and to so rock. The, oh boy. Yeah. This is going to be fun. Of course I got to, I got to start working my way back up. I haven't been playing much and, and uh, so well, get off your butt and but start anyway. doing that, man. Let's, let's go. <laughs> I started last night actually. Okay. Okay. I pulled out uh, my guitar and started strumming. I was like, Hey, cause you always doubt yourself. I pulled out my guitar. I'm like, no, no, I can still do this. Like, you know, because at times you'll wonder, can I do this anymore? Do I suck? Do I not suck? Jeez, it's been a tough year with you. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, when you don't get that that reinforcement from people. Yeah. Even though I know exactly, I know what part of the song I wrote. I know what part I produced. I know what guitar part I played. I know all that stuff. Mm. I can tell you that I, I never sit around and go, oh, yeah, man, I'm the shit. It just, it's weird. It, it, it. This is the odd dichotomy of an, at least my artist brain. And that is, even though I know I did that stuff, I don't get the, uh, uh, I don't know, the security or the uh, knowing that I did that. You still feel like, yeah, I suck. Mm-hmm. You, you got part of that. You know what you did. And it, it's like the, the, it's a disconnect between the head and the heart. Right. right. Like, and you got to play with your heart. You did it, but sometimes you're, well, sometimes your head can know you did that thing, but you don't feel that you've done it. So yeah, it's a weird thing. Some, you know, you wonder, you know, when you, if you go to write a song one day and you it's don't like losing your it. mojo. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You wonder, mm-hmm. will I ever be able to write a song again? And then you'll write one and go, yeah, that was so stupid. I can't believe I thought that. And then mm-hmm. the next time you'll go and you'll do it and it'll be the same thing over again. Yeah. I don't know if I can write a song and you'll end up writing one. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it'll be good to get, get back out and play all that to say. So yeah. Uh, I can tell you're raring to go and some of the videos I've seen, uh, that's going to be quite a performance. So uh, I'm going to try to try to do my best to get there. Uh, it'll be, that'll yeah, be sweet. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you. I'll make myself a note to reach out to you. Uh, uh, hopefully it's better than doing this podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the funny part was <laughs> soon as that's coming out of my mouth, I'm like, dude, you got it. Like, I pictured the calendar. I'm going to make myself a reminder because I go, you just open yourself. Ooh, 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 ooh. That was me <laughs> taking some blows. I'm like, yeah, as it should be. Oh, man. <laughs> well, thanks again, Jamie Lee. Oh, and uh, yeah, 
That'll it'll be good. So I'm looking forward to. We'll, we'll see one. each other again, my friend. Absolutely.